Hello everyone, welcome to the course Basic Cognitive Processes. I am Dr. Ark Verma from IIT Kanpur. We have been talking about aspects of memory in our recent lectures. We covered sensory memory in the first of this series and we talked about short term memory in the last lecture. Today I am going to talk to you about another aspect of short term memory. Uh, let us say a rethought version of what short term memory will be doing and uh, the name given to this is called working memory. Now, the concept of working memory as opposed to short term memory was put forward by Alan Badley. Uh, Alan Badley, one of the most uh, uh, influential researchers uh, in uh, memory, uh, basically proposed that short term memory processes must be dynamic and they must also consider the number of components that can function separately. Now, one of the ideas why Alan Badley must have thought so is that short term memory or let us say if you liken it to the RAM of your computers, uh, it deals with a lot of information, it deals with a variety of information and it manipulates these variety of information. Whereas, the whole concept of short term memory might uh, be taken to think that it just passively stores information for some time before it passes on to the long term memory. So, these were some of the conceptual differences which probably led to the formation of this concept of working memory. So, according to this idea with this in background, uh, it can be probably proposed and Alan Badley might have thought that the digit span task must be handled by a separate component altogether while comprehending of the paragraph, if you remember Spaker's uh, study as well, uh, might be handled by a different component. The model Badley was uh, proposing was first described in his paper by Graham Hitch uh, and the paper was written in 1974, Badley and Hitch and it was later modified. So, uh, later versions and more uh, recent versions have also come of that model. Uh, but this model basically says that short term memory, it has a very specific component called working memory. And working memory they define as a limited capacity system for temporary storage and manipulation of information. And this temporary storage and manipulation of information is basically dependent on complex tasks such as comprehension, learning and reasoning, whatever the person might be called upon to do. Whatever task you have at hand, you probably take it to what is called working memory. From this definition, we can say that we are actually talking of a more dynamical system as opposed to what the initial conception of short term memory was. So, two differences might be pointed out that while short term memory is uh, concerned primarily with storing information, manipulation of information is basically the job of working memory. Also, short term memory uh, has been thought of as consisting of a single component, while in working memory you can think of different independent components, different components working in an independent fashion, though they might be interconnected as well. So, working memory as such again given this new conception uh, accomplishes the uh, manipulation of information through the action of three components as proposed by Alan Badley. Uh, the components are the phonological loop, the visual spatial sketch pad and the central executive. Phonological loop, it is supposed to consist of two components. It consists of the phonological store, which is a limited capacity store and holds information for only a few seconds and the articulatory rehearsal process, which is responsible for the rehearsal that can keep items in the phonological store from decaying. Suppose somebody told you a phone number to memorize and before you find a pen or before you find, you know, your cell phone to, uh, you know, quickly type that number into, you might want to keep repeating that so that the information, this version verbal information or let us say this phonological information is maintained in the phonological store. This phonological uh, uh, store as I already said holds verbal that is language like and auditory information that is the one of sounds. The visual spatial sketch pad on the other hand holds visual and spatial information. Anything about the visual world, anything about location of objects, those kind of things if you are given a task of keeping three bags in the boot of your car and uh, you have to just, you have just been asked that do you think these three bags will fit in the boot of my car? You might want to really visualize what the boot of your car looks like and try and fit these things in an imaginative fashion before saying yes to this question. This kind of information, this kind of manipulation is basically supposed to be achieved via the use of this visual spatial sketch pad. The third component 
basically is the central executive wherein the major work of the working memory occurs. The central executive pulls information from the long term memory and coordinates the activity of the phonological loop and the visual spatial sketch pad by focusing on specific parts of a task and uh, switching attention from one part of the task to other. Suppose it is like desk secretary where you go and give the task and the secretary decides where this particular file needs to go to whether it needs to go to phonological loop or it needs to go to the visual spatial sketch pad. So, one of the main tasks also of this phonological loop is to decide how to divide attention be between two tasks. So, if you are given a task to working memory, the central executive is the process that will decide whether and how this task is supposed to be handled, which parts of the task will be handled by the phonological loop and which parts of this task will be handled by the visual spatial sketch pad. Uh, herein you can see a graphic representation of the phonological loop and the visual spatial sketch pad. You will see that the uh, circle which is the central executive, it is kind of coordinating between two, these two things. An example given for in this uh, figure by Goldstein is basically uh, when you are kind of you know listening to instructions and still driving the car. You are listening to the instructions and maintaining them in your phonological store while you are actually visually and spatially coordinating the uh, car on the different paths according to whatever instructions are being given to you. So, this is one very uh, uh, dynamic kind of an example wherein you are basically using both the phonological loop and the visual spatial sketch pad at the same time in the same task. Let us elaborate a little bit on the phonological loop, what are the different uh, effects, what are the research findings in this. So, the phonological loop, one of the major findings in the, uh, related to the phonological loop is called the phonological similarity effect, which is basically that if you are kind of trying to maintain uh, letters or sounds which are very, very similar, those might be confused with each other. If you remember Conrad's experiment, he did this experiment with the uh, people who were asked to remember uh, digit, uh, who were asked to remember letters of the English alphabet, and they were confusing. They were making some mistakes, but more importantly, the mistake was basically being made on those letters which sounded very uh, similar to each other, like the S and the F example that was there. Also, another effect about the phonological loop is the word length effect. Word length effect occurs when memory for the list of words is better for short words and uh, than for long words. If I give you a list of words to remember and some are like three or four letter words and the others are five or six or seven letter words may be, uh, then the uh, typical finding is that the memory for shorter words is better than the memory for longer words. Another important phenomena is called articulatory suppression. Articulatory suppression is one of these ways wherein the operation of the phonological loop can be disrupted. So, this occurs when a person is prevented from rehearsing some verbal information by asking them to repeat an irrelevant sound. So if I have to ask you to uh, remember few phone numbers, maybe a list of phone numbers, but I say ok, you have to remember this. still. By till during remembering this, you still have to keep saying uh, any irrelevant sound like da 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 ba 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 whatever. So what happens here is that because you're kind of repeating these irrelevant sound, it blocks uh, the rehearsal space for the numbers that I have given you and that results in what is called and what has been described as articulatory suppression. You cannot maintain too much verbal information at the same time in the phonological loop. That is why this particular phenomenon occurs. Barley and colleagues, they basically found and they did this a very simple experiment uh, that repeating the, 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 the continuously not only reduces the ability to remember a list of words, but also eliminates the word length effect. Uh, here you can see the typical word length effects, there were percentage recall of short words is much higher than longer words. But when participants are asked to repeat the, 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 the continuously, you see that the advantage for the shorter words is uh, completely uh, you know or almost uh, gone uh, and the uh, total percentage of recall is almost equivalent to what it is for the longer words. Coming to the visual spatial sketch pad, now the visual spatial sketch pad as I said handles visual and spatial information and is therefore involved in the process of visual imagery. You know the example I gave if you have if somebody asks you that whether these uh, three or four bags uh, will fit in the boot of your car, you will have some memory of how the boot of your car looks like, what are its dimensions and what you will try to do is you will try to fit each of these bags imaginarily in an imaginative way in your car. And you will say that okay, maybe this bag will be put horizontal, this bag will be put vertically, maybe I will slant this bag over this one and this is how it will fill up. So, this is basically a typical example of visual imagery. 
and visual imagery is obviously achieved by what is called the visuospatial sketch pad. Now, another uh, very interesting and very famous experiment about visual imagery was done by Shepard and Metzler in 1971. Now, Shepard and Metzler measured participants reaction time to decide whether a pair of objects were same or different. So, they made these imaginary objects and the task of the participants was to tell whether the two objects are the same or they are different. So, from this uh, function they are trying to see uh, how the participants would perform, it could be seen that when two uh, uh, shapes were separated by an orientation difference of around 40 degrees, it took 2 seconds for the participants to decide that the pair was same and but for a difference of 140 degrees it took around 4 seconds. So, the whole idea is that say for example, show you the figures, the figures are like this. So, if I give you uh, you know one pair in panel A and the other pair in panel B, what you have to do to achieve this task is basically try and mentally rotate the first uh, figure in panel A see whether it resembles the other figure in panel B or say for example, if you to try and uh, rotate the first figure in panel B and see whether it matches the second figure in panel B. So, you will have to maintain uh, it, this in your memory and then rotate it and then try and match it with this figure with the second figure. Uh, and here you can see as the number as the angular difference between A and B as orientation differs, the time taken to recognize or the time taken to say whether it is same or different also increases. Based on these findings, Shefford and Metzler concluded that participants were solving the problem by rotating the image of one of the objects in their mind, a phenomenon which was later named mental rotation. Now, Lee Brooks uh, also did some experiment in which he demonstrated how the interference uh, can affect the operation of the visual spatial sketch pad. So, what he did was he uh, the task is something like this, there are two figures here 5.20, 5.21 from Goldstein's cognitive psychology. Now, the task is basically to visualize the figure f in uh, 5.20, maintain it, then you cover it uh, while visualizing uh, this in your mind still. And then what you do is you start at the uh, leftmost corner, left top corner and actually you move around uh, to the around the outline of uh, the F and what you have to do is for an outside corner say in and for an inside corner say out. So, you have to kind of move around the trajectory of this figure and say in or out take that uh, decision. Now, a different task could also be that you visualize the F again, but this time you move around the outline of the F in a clockwise direction and in your mind say out if the corner is an outside corner in if the corner is an inside corner. Remember you are doing the opposite of this in the last task. They asked many people to do this task and they found that most people find the pointing task much more difficult. The reason is that holding the image of a letter and pointing are both visual spatial tasks. So, the visual spatial sketch pad in that sense becomes overloaded. In contrast, saying out or in, in an articulatory uh, uh, task that is handled by phonological loop. So, speaking uh, does not interfere with visualizing f. If you remember, again I will remind, in this first task you have to mentally uh, point out uh, uh, out or in, wherein this one you have to say out or in. So, that is why in the second one, the visual spatial sketch pad does not really get overloaded, because some of the information is verbal and is shifted to the phonological store. Now, coming to the central executive. Now, the central executive is the component that makes the working memory actually working. We were uh, describing that uh, some time back. So, it is the control center of the working memory system. Its mission is not to store information, but to coordinate how information is going to be used by the two uh, working components. Now, Badley describes uh, the central ex system as the attentional controller. He says that this one determines how attention will be focused on a specific task and how it will be divided in the two tasks depending on the task demand and how easy or difficult the task will be. Now, the central executive is therefore essential in situations say for example, if a person is attempting to simultaneously drive and use a cell phone, not that it is advisable to do so, somebody is trying to do that, uh, then a central executive uh, is basically you know it will uh, spring into action. Now, in this example, the central executive would be controlling the phonological loop process that is talking in the phone. The sketch pad will basically be doing the navigation, which is basically identifying the landmarks and the layout of the streets and taking the car off. One of the ways the central executive has been studied is by assessing the behavior of patients with brain damage. As we have seen, the frontal lobe is supposed to play a central role in working memory. 
Therefore, patients with frontal lobe damage have found to be having more problems with attention control. For example, a typical example could be perseveration that is repeatedly doing uh, the same behavior again and again even if the one does not achieve the desired goal. Now, say for example, I give you an example, a problem that can be easily solved by a rule that pick up the right object, a person with frontal lobe uh, damage might be responding correctly on each trial as long as the uh, rule stays the same. As soon as you change the rule, uh, the person with frontal lobe damage will find it very difficult to adapt to the new rule and uh, it will continue doing the same task uh, again and again, it will uh, continue picking the red object again and again even though the rule has already changed. So, they have, why is this? Because they are having difficulty uh, in changing their attention from the first rule to the second rule, that is what the problem here is. Another example of how the central executive controls attention is uh, provided by situations in which a person might be focused, uh, you know, might be supposed to focus attention on some relevant stimuli while ignoring the other irrelevance. In visual search kind of a scenario, you have to focus your attention on the targets while at the same time ignoring the distractors. Some people have been found to be better at focusing attention than some others. Uh, Another component here, another important aspect here could be the episodic buffer which also is part of this working memory thing. Now, the episodic buffer basically uh, you know uh, is uh, something, it is basically one aspect of working memory that can hold uh, more than uh, it would be expected based on just the phonological loop or the visual spatial sketch pad. So, for to account for these extra uh, information that are held in the working memory, uh, one might, uh, one has proposed what is called the episodic buffer. For example, people can remember long sentences of consisting as many as 15 to 20 words. Now, the ability to do this is achieved via chunking which we have talked about earlier in which meaningful units have been lumped together, have been joined together. Now, badly decided that it was necessary to propose an additional component of working memory like the episodic buffer to address these different kind of abilities which are not being explained already by the phonological store and the visual spatial sketch pad. This new component that is the episodic buffer can store more information thereby providing extra capacity and is already connected to the long term memory thereby making this exchange between long term memory and working memory possible. Because even if you are working at new information, if, even if you are manipulating new objects in, in the world which you are being uh, given, you are certainly drawing uh, upon the skill and experiences that you have gained and that is stored in the long term memory. Uh, here is uh, the complete model of uh, uh, Alan Badley's uh, working memory model and herein you can now see all the four components. So, there is the central executive, there is the phonological loop, there is the episodic buffer and the visual spatial sketch pad and each of these in their own way will interact with the long term memory. This is a complete model which has been used to explain so many findings, so many research findings from uh, working memory. Now, note that this model also shows the, that visual spatial sketch pad and phonological uh, loop also are connected to the long term memory. Now, the proposal of the episodic buffer represents one step in the evolution of Badley's model because the initial model did not have uh, the episodic buffer provided for. This has been stimulating uh, research in memory for over 30 years since it was first proposed in 1970s. Now, the exact functioning of the episodic buffer still seems a little vague, it is not really been completely specified, but it is uh, uh, supposed to be uh, a very important aspect. Now, let us come to uh, how the working memory is specified in the human brain. Now, there have been uh, quite a few ways in which people wanted to study how does memory really exist in the brain or how do you, uh, you know, look at the brain and say something about working memory. Now, four of these things have been done, say for example, analysis of the behavior after brain damage when people have brain damage in areas which are supposed to be related to uh, memory uh, per se, uh, recordings have been done from single neurons, single cell recordings, this is, this is basically limited to animals and not really humans. Uh, then EEG signals which is electroencephalography, if you remember the methods chapter I have talked about that, if you remember the methods chapter I have talked about, it might be a good time to go back and uh, refer to them. Now, uh, one of the tasks was done with the uh, monkeys, uh, so the delayed response task. Now, early research on uh, frontal lobe memory was carried out in monkeys using what is called the delayed response task. Basically, this task required the monkey to hold information in their working memory during a delay period, so that is why delayed response task. Uh, 
Now, what happens in this task is the monkey sees a food reward in one of two food wells. Now, the monkey is inside the cage. There are two food wells outside the monkey's cage, and uh, the both wells are covered. Uh, the monkey sees that uh, the food uh, reward is kept in one and then they are covered and then a screen is lowered so that the monkey cannot see uh, you know where this is so he cannot maintain that information and then after this delay the screen is raised. What the monkey has to do is that it must remember which of the food well had already received the food before it was covered and then uncover that well and take the food out and eat it. That's very simple and monkeys uh, can be trained to accomplish this task. This is the setup of uh, this particular task. Now, however, when the prefrontal cortex was removed, uh, their performance, monkeys performance dropped to the level of chance and they were found to be correct only 50 percent of the time. Now, this basically uh, supports the idea that the prefrontal cortex is very important for holding information for brief periods of time. Does this uh, happen in humans as well? Is, is, are these the same areas in humans as well? So, people have also investigated the brain activation in humans. Now, the conclusion that many brain areas are involved in working memory has been confirmed by research using neuroimaging techniques such as PET that is positron emotion tomography and functional fMRI and functional MRI. Basically, the idea is to measure the brain activity in humans in response to tasks which involve memory uh, or working memory. Now, uh, here is the figure, it shows that what are the different areas found in humans which are found to be uh, involved in uh, memory operations. You will see that there are particular areas uh, which are involved with verbal and uh, numeric information, other areas uh, involved with objects information, other areas with spatial information and problem solving. All of this uh, is very well demonstrated in this figure from Goldstein's book. Now, Vogel and co-workers, they did an experiment on the allocation of attention by measuring a component of, uh, component of ERP in humans, which is recorded during a working memory task. Now, the response they were measuring was related to encoding the number of items in working memory. So, a larger ERP response would indicate that more space was used in working memory. So, they previous on the basis of previous research, they uh, determined that which component generally is involved in working memory and then they uh, were doing this test to see that if the task we are giving involves more or less working memory. So, Vogel and colleagues separated participants into two groups based on their performance uh, on a particular test of working memory. Now, participants uh, in high working memory capacity group, those who had higher working memory capacity were found that they were able to uh, maintain a um, larger number of items in working memory as compared to participants with low working memory capacity. Both the groups viewed the simile as shown in the figure, I will just show you the figure right now uh, and they first saw a cue indicating whether to direct their attention to the left side, uh, red triangles on the left side or the red triangles on the uh, right side of the displays uh, and then they saw a memory display for around one tenth of a second followed by a brief blank screen and then it was a test display. Now, on some trials what happens is that I will just show you the figure. Uh, so, this is the thing there is a fixation cross and there is a queue and then there is a memory display wherein they have to uh, remember where this uh, red uh, rectangles are and then there is a delay and then there is a test display. Okay, so, they have to determine uh, whether red rectangles uh, are still there or not. Now, on some trials the red uh, the two red rectangles presented on the left and right side of the screen as shown in the figure here uh, in panel A. Uh, but on a few other trials, uh, two blue rectangles were also presented. They were also added uh, to this entire array. Here you can see trial uh, panel B, wherein the uh, blue uh, rectangles have also been added in addition to the already present red rectangles. So, the Im uh, amount of work in maintaining this will slightly become harder. So, the participants task here again was to respond to the test display by indicating whether the orientations of the red rectangles in the queued side of the test display was the same or different than of the memory display. So, they would have to maintain both that it is a red uh, rectangle and its orientation. Now, the results uh, show that the size of ERP for both groups, they kind of try and compare the size of the ERP component for both the groups. The left pair of bars here shows that when there were two red uh, rectangles, it was still a higher response for the low working memory capacity group, but a good, uh, but a lower response for a high working memory capacity group. 
But if you see in the second panel in the right uh, pair of bars, you will see that addition of two blue rectangles does not increase the response too much in the high working memory capacity groups, but it kind of causes a drastic change in the response in the ERP response of the low working memory capacity group. So, what is basically happening here is that uh, by addition of two extra red uh, blue rectangles in the display, you are increasing the amount of effort uh, in the participants and the low working memory capacity participants, because uh, this task involves uh, ignoring the blue rectangles as distractors, the low working memory capacity participants are finding it hard to ignore that and that is why their uh, ERP response to this task, the one shown in panel B here, uh, is much higher. Now, what does this tell us? Uh, now, the fact that adding the two blue rectangles had little effect on, I am just kind of repeating this uh, so that you kind of follow this. So, the fact that adding the two uh, blue rectangles had little effect on the response of high capacity group means that these participants were very efficient at ignoring the distractors. So, the irrelevant blue stimuli did not do much damage to them, did not take up any space in their working memories. This means that the central executive was functioning well uh, for these participants. The fact that adding the two blue rectangles caused a large increase in the response of the lower working memory capacity group uh, means that these participants were not able to sufficiently and uh, properly ignore the blue uh, rectangles which were anyways irrelevant to the task because the task is not changed. So, it tells us blue uh, rectangles were acquiring a lot of space in their working memory and their central executive was not operating as efficiently as that of the higher working memory capacity group. Now, what can we conclude from this? We can conclude that and Vogel and colleagues uh, basically conclude that some people's uh, central executives might be better than others uh, at allocating attention and at controlling this whole workflow information during a particular task. So, I think that is all about working memory uh, and in the next uh, lecture, we will talk about some other aspects of memory. Thank you.